Starship full stack is back, and the wet dress rehearsal could be reattempted next week. The FAA closed the investigation into the second Starship test flight and listed 17 corrective actions to be completed before Flight 3. Adding to the excitement, NASA and SpaceX have tested the Starship Lunar Lander docking system, crucial for Artemis missions. Join us as we delve into the heart of these latest developments. Starship 28 underwent an engine spin prime test last Monday, crucial for preparing the vehicle for the integrated flight test. Ship 28 had at least two of its engines replaced at the production site in early February, necessitating tests to verify their performance ahead of launch. On Monday morning, frost and condensation were observed forming on the oxygen tank of the ship, indicating the loading of liquid oxygen into the vehicle. Subsequently, the engines began venting, signaling the start of engine chill. Finally, the spin prime test was conducted, during which the engine's oxygen turbo pump was spun up to operating speeds and liquid oxygen flowed through it, ensuring the pump's functionality. This test aimed to validate the plumbing and spin up of the newly installed engines. In tandem with the preparations for the spin prime, a comprehensive test was conducted to assess the performance of the orbital tank farm, launch mount, and launch tower. This test involved pumping propellants through the heat exchangers, pipes, valves, and plumbing of these stage zero structures to verify their functionality. Two weeks prior, the Ship 28 Booster 10 full stack wet dress rehearsal was aborted due to issues with propellant loading. Later, the vehicles were de stacked, and since then, teams have been diligently working on launch pad repairs, with a focus on the booster and Starship quick disconnect mechanisms. The Stage Zero purge test conducted last Monday indicated that the fixes were complete and an uninterrupted flow of propellants could be expected during future testing. Typically, a static fire test follows the spin prime test, but Ship 28 did not undergo this procedure. Instead, it was removed from the test stand on Wednesday, February 28. Super Heavy Booster 10, which was sent back to the production site for fixes after the failed wet dress rehearsal attempts, was rolled out to the launch site the same day morning. The booster was later lifted with the help of the launch tower arms, carefully positioned atop the launch mount. Following this, on Thursday morning, Ship 28 was moved towards the launch pad and placed in between the tower arms. The ship will soon be hoisted and stacked atop Booster 10, completing the full stack assembly once again. SpaceX will likely attempt to conduct the wet dress rehearsal next week. Let's hope that the test will go as planned without any anomalies. The Federal Aviation Administration announced last week that they have closed their investigation into the second Starship integrated flight test that took place in November. On that launch, the launch vehicles, Booster 9 and Starship 25, appeared to perform as expected through stage separation. However, Booster 9 broke apart shortly after separation as it was attempting to perform a controlled re-entry and splashdown in the Gulf of Mexico. Meanwhile, Ship 25 encountered an anomaly as it approached the end of its burn for a lengthy suborbital trajectory. In January, Elon Musk revealed that the anomaly was associated with venting excess liquid oxygen propellant toward the end of the second stage burn, but he didn't elaborate on how the venting triggered the explosion. As per FAA, the mishap investigation, which SpaceX led, revealed a leak in the aft section of the spacecraft during the initiation of the liquid oxygen vent. This resulted in a combustion event and subsequent fires that disrupted communication between the spacecraft's flight computers. At the time of the incident, the vehicle had reached an altitude of 150 kilometers and achieved a velocity of approximately 24,000 kilometers per hour. Drawing lessons from the November incident, adjustments to the liquid oxygen venting procedure have already been implemented on Starship 28 to mitigate the risk of explosion during Flight 3. The investigation report also addressed a loss of the Super Heavy Booster 9. 13 of its 33 Raptor engines were firing in a boost back maneuver after stage separation when several engines shut down, including one that failed energetically. This led to the booster breaking apart at an altitude of 90 kilometers over the Gulf of Mexico. The company said the most likely explanation for the failure was a filter blockage in a liquid oxygen line, which reduced inlet pressure in engine turbo pumps, which eventually resulted in one engine failing in a way that resulted in the loss of the vehicle. After the mishap investigation, the FAA outlined 17 corrective actions that SpaceX must implement to receive a license for Flight 3, with seven pertaining to the Super Heavy Booster and the remaining 10 to the Starship upper stage. The 17 corrective actions represent a significant improvement from the first flight, which required 63 corrective actions before the rocket launched again. Neither the FAA nor SpaceX provided a schedule for completing the corrective actions and launching the third test flight. However, an FAA official suggested that early to mid-March is a reasonable timeline for the regulatory process to conclude.
and Musk, on February 19, in a conversation on his social media platform X, said that SpaceX is targeting the second week of March for Flight 3. At Starbase, groundwork has commenced for the construction of the second Starship launch tower. Recent reports indicate that the new tower will be situated near the suborbital tank farm, deviating from the originally planned location south of the existing tower. This change of plan will replace the old suborbital launch pad, which currently serves as a test stand for Starship static fire testing. Consequently, static fire testing of Starship prototypes will be relocated to the Massey's test site, located several kilometers from Starbase. Currently, cryogenic proof tests of both ships and boosters are conducted at the site. SpaceX has already begun the construction of a test stand and flame trench for static fire testing at Massey's. Upon completion, these facilities will closely resemble this graphics from Ryan Hansen Space. Meanwhile, five prefabricated sections for the second launch tower have already arrived at Starbase, with two additional sections awaiting transportation from SpaceX's Roberts Road facility within the Kennedy Space Center. Construction of the eighth and ninth sections of the tower is underway at the build site, with stacking scheduled to commence once groundworks are completed. Last week, three new small bullet tanks were delivered to the launch site and installed in the tank farm near the vertical propellant storage tanks. These tanks are speculated to be used for water storage to compensate for the water tank decommissioned in January. These new bullet tanks are one of the latest additions to the orbital tank farm. Two weeks ago, two vertical nitrogen storage tanks and several heat exchangers were delivered to the launch site. All these latest upgrades to the tank farm will enable faster loading of propellants into the launch vehicle, enhancing operational speed and efficiency. At the production site, Starship 29 was recently relocated from Mega Bay 2 to the High Bay. Ship 29 has been undergoing engine installation inside Mega Bay 2 for the past few weeks. It looks like the ship has received all its engines and will soon be ready for static fire testing. Currently, Starships 29, 30, and 31 are positioned inside the high bay, with Ship 32 located at the Rocket Garden. Within the Mega Bay, Boosters 11, 12, and 13 are present, along with the partially stacked oxygen tank section of Booster 14. In short, SpaceX has four Starships and Boosters in complete or nearly complete build stages to fly after Flight 3. According to an FAA official, SpaceX is seeking a modification of its limit of five Starship launches per year to accommodate at least nine launches annually. While achieving nine launches this year may be unlikely, such a launch cadence could become feasible in subsequent years. On February 28, NASA announced the agency and SpaceX recently performed a qualification test of a Starship lunar lander docking system. As part of the Artemis lunar landing missions, astronauts launched aboard NASA's Orion capsule will be transferred to a Starship lander in lunar orbit, facilitating their descent to the lunar surface. After surface activities are complete, the ship will return the astronauts to Orion, waiting in lunar orbit. This crew transfer requires Orion to successfully dock with the Starship lander in lunar orbit. The Starship docking mechanism is based on SpaceX's flight-proven Dragon 2 docking system, used on missions to the International Space Station. The recent series of docking system tests took place at NASA's Johnson Space Center over a span of 10 days, utilizing a system that simulates contact dynamics between two spacecraft in orbit. The testing encompassed over 200 docking scenarios, incorporating various approach angles and speeds. By utilizing full-scale hardware, these real-world tests aim to validate computer models of the moon lander's docking system, ensuring its reliability and efficacy. In addition, NASA disclosed in their latest article that since the selection of Starship as the lander for returning humans to the lunar surface, SpaceX has achieved over 30 human landing system-specific milestones. Now, let's discuss some of the latest updates from the world of science and technology. We have some latest updates on the Nova Sea and Slim Lunar Landers, both of which have successfully touched down on the Moon in recent missions. NASA and Intuitive Machines have deemed the Nova Sea lunar landing mission an unqualified success, despite a hard landing that left the spacecraft askew. Intuitive Machines launched their Nova Sea lander, named Odysseus, on February 15 to deliver small commercial payloads to the lunar surface as part of NASA's Commercial Lunar Payload Services program. As planned, on February 22, the lander touched down near the rim of the Malapert A crater, approximately 300 kilometers from the lunar south pole. Just 10 minutes later, it began transmitting signals back to Earth, confirming its safe arrival on the lunar surface. What we can confirm, without a doubt, is our equipment is on the surface of the moon, and we are transmitting.
However, upon further analysis, intuitive machines discovered that Odysseus, as it approached the lunar surface, mistakenly believed it was approximately 100 meters higher relative to the moon than it actually was. Consequently, instead of touching down with a vertical velocity of 1 meter per second and no lateral movement, the lander descended three times faster, with a lateral speed of 2 meters per second. As a result, the lander made a hard landing, breaking one of its six landing legs and toppling over. Intuitive machines said that two of the spacecraft's communication antennae were damaged and its solar panels were facing the wrong direction, limiting its ability to recharge its batteries. Odysseus carried a diverse range of payloads on board, including instruments for measuring lunar soil composition, detecting water ice deposits, and investigating radio astronomy and space weather interactions. Fortunately, most of the payloads continued operating after the harsh landing and collected crucial data. As of February 28, NASA had successfully downloaded approximately 50 megabytes of data from the lander, surpassing the baseline for success, which was a single bit of data. Odysseus entered the long lunar night on February 28 as the sun dipped toward the horizon. When the sun rises at Odysseus's landing site in two to three weeks, intuitive machines will attempt to wake up the spacecraft, but the chances are uncertain. Japan's space agency, JAXA, managed to establish communication with its slim moon lander, despite the spacecraft not being expected to function after the lunar night. SLIM, short for Smart Lander for Investigating Moon, was launched on September 7 atop an H-2A rocket from Japan's Tanegashima Space Center, along with the CRISM Space Telescope. The spacecraft successfully touched down inside the Shioli crater near the lunar equator on January 19, making Japan the fifth country to soft land a spacecraft on the moon. Nevertheless, an anomaly occurred during the descent phase, resulting in terminal damage to one of the two primary engines, leading to uneven thrust. Consequently, SLIM landed in a nose-down position, orienting its solar panels westward, impeding sufficient sunlight from reaching its systems. Despite this setback, SLIM carried out scientific missions during the approximately 14 Earth day-long lunar daytime. However, the spacecraft's operations on the surface have been limited due to its incorrect orientation. After that, SLIM was put into a deep sleep mode for the impending harsh lunar night. JAXA said at the time that SLIM was not designed to survive the deep cold of roughly 14 Earth day lunar nighttime, as temperatures will fall below minus 130 Celsius, damaging the spacecraft electronics. But surprisingly, on February 25, when JAXA sent wake-up calls to SLIM, the spacecraft responded, confirming its successful survival through the lunar night while maintaining communication capabilities. The SLIM team hoped that, having survived the lunar night, the spacecraft will be able to continue its scientific operations in the coming days. Simultaneously, a comprehensive investigation is underway to determine the root cause of the engine malfunction during the landing. Please check out the links in the description to learn more about the Nova Sea and SLIM landers. India has unveiled the names of four astronaut candidates who have been selected to participate in the country's inaugural space flight, slated for next year. The mission, known as the Gaganyaan, aims to send three astronauts to an orbit of 400 kilometers and bring them back after three days. The crew members were chosen from a pool of Indian Air Force pilots. They had undergone extensive physical and psychological tests and rigorous training for 13 months in Russia before being shortlisted. However, only three of them will eventually embark on the seven-day journey into space as part of the Gaganyaan mission. The Gaganyaan crew module is a fully autonomous spacecraft designed to carry a three-member crew to orbit for up to seven days and safely return to Earth. The space capsule will have life support and environmental control systems. It will be equipped with emergency mission abort capabilities and a crew escape system. The crew module will be mated to the service module, which provides power, propulsion, and thermal control, as well as water and a breathable atmosphere for the astronauts. Gaganyaan mission will be launched atop ISRO's GSLV Mark III launch vehicle from Sathish Dhawan Space Center in Sriharikota. Before the crewed mission in 2025, ISRO plans to conduct three uncrewed orbital test flights of the crew capsule. These test flights will feature Vyam Mitra, a humanoid robot developed by ISRO, equipped with sensors to help scientists study the effects of weightlessness and radiation on the human body during prolonged space missions. The first uncrewed Gaganyaan test flight is scheduled for July of this year followed by the second mission in December and the third in mid-2025. If the crewed mission next year proves successful, India will join the ranks of the world's elite space-faring nations as the fourth country to successfully execute a crewed space mission. Thank you for tuning in for the latest science news and Starship updates. If you enjoyed this video, please hit the like button, leave a comment, and share it with your friends. Also, don't forget to subscribe to the channel and turn on notifications so you never miss an episode.